All right, we're in Hebrews chapter 3 this morning, verses 7 through 19. How many of you have seen the movie A Christmas Story? Okay, you're, you're, most of you are familiar with that. There's a common theme running through the movie. What is it? Thank you. It is a, it is a dire warning. Warnings are helpful. Sometimes, though, you get tired of seeing the warning label on your can of shaving cream. The warning label on your car door that says, drive safely. We see so many warnings all the time that we start ignoring them because oftentimes they're idiotic. Warning, firearms can be dangerous. Really? Wow. Thank you. We've heard it all before. And sometimes what that means is we ignore important warnings that come to us. And so here as we come to chapter 3 of Hebrews, verse 7 through 19, we come to the first warning that the book of Hebrews has for us. And I'd like you to take a look at that. Chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. And the author says, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear, my, hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That's why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray. They've not known my ways. So I declared and on oath in my anger, they should never enter my rest. Yikes. Let's pray. Father, help us not to ignore this warning. Help us to see what it is you have to say to us. Not a threat but a warning to call us to serve you and to not ignore you. Teach us, we pray from your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of my favorite professors from college had a message out of Deuteronomy that he called Funerals in the Wilderness. Because God said that that entire generation that came out of Egypt, would not enter the promised land. And this was what my professor called his last sermon at a church that refused to change before he, he was either fired or resigned. And that is, he would go through the congregation, here lies brother so-and-so, here lies sister so-and-so, and give their epitaph. He did that at a church when he was a still a college a student and resigned, walked out the door with his family, went to the parsonage next door, started packing their bags. Nobody left the building. They kept packing their bags, kept looking out the window. Nobody left the building. Finally, an hour later, the chairman deacon came over and asked them to stay. <laughs> I would say that pretty much needs to be the last ditch sermon. <laughs> but in fact, the author of Hebrews is giving to us this message up front. Don't ignore God's warning. There are several in the book, by the way, scattered throughout the book of Hebrews. And the warnings are this. God is a loving Savior, but don't mistake God's love and patience or apathy. He is not apathetic. He doesn't, eh, you know, if you want to drive off a cliff, that's your business. He's not that way. He deals with rebellion as a good father would. That is, he deals with it. My theology professor at seminary, Dr. Bill Hendricks, said that God's love and wrath are two sides of the same coin. The fire that warms also burns. It depends on where you're standing. You stand next to a fire, you can be warm. You stand in a fire, you might have some problems. Uh, Psalm 103 
8 through 13 says this. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquity. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. God is gracious and compassionate. He's patient with us. He forgives our sins. And when he forgives, he forgets. They're gone. He doesn't then, the next time you get in trouble, go back and go, well, here's the list of all the things you've done wrong. Matter of fact, if you confess your sins to God, and then you come back five minutes later and say, God, you remember that? No, sorry, don't remember a thing. Not because he's stupid or old. It's because he chooses. It's gone. He does not hold that against us anymore. But the message here in Hebrew is, Hebrews is, Israel heard God's voice in the wilderness. They experienced God's power in delivering them from Egypt, in providing for them in the wilderness, and yet they still rebelled time after time. And rebellion has consequences. Always. And so Hebrews puts it this way. And so God swore that they would not enter into his rest. Now, in the book of Hebrews, that is a metaphor for missing out on God's salvation. Rest is a picture of entering the promised land, a land of milk and honey, where everyone would have a vineyard and eat from their own vineyard and their farm and everybody would be happy. But by the time we get to the New Testament, it has grown to encompass a spiritual understanding and an eternal perspective. And so when the writer of Hebrews is saying this, he is talking about your salvation, your eternal life in God. If you rebel against God, you will not find rest in God. The stakes are higher than just missing out on a swell life here and now. Rebellion against God, especially after knowing God and experiencing His grace and power, well, is particularly stupid. And that you'll see that several times here in the book of Hebrews. Now Hebrews doesn't teach, as some people think, that you can lose your salvation. But the teaching is, don't take God for granted. Now you may think, well, wait a minute. There's Hebrews 6 and there's a couple of other things. Be careful. We'll get there. I do not believe Hebrews teaches you can lose your salvation. The rest of Scripture doesn't. And so, let's take a look at what he has for us. But he's saying to us, especially to you who know God, don't take God for granted. Don't take his grace for granted. Don't take his patience for granted. If you can say, well... You know, I sure, I've had God's love in my life, but right now, I'm just not, I don't care. It's, it's not that important to me. You know what? I can sin and just ask for forgiveness. And, you know, that, God doesn't care. I challenge you to read the minor prophets, and the major prophets for that matter, and kings and chronicles, and you'll find that this is an accusation God makes against his people in the Old Testament. You say, God doesn't care. We can just do anything we want. And God says, au contraire. Don't take God for granted. Look at verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. The lesson for the ages. 
examine your heart. Don't live in fear. That's not what he's saying here. Oh no. What if I offend God? I might get smited any moment now. Do you want to know how to re deal with rebellion? Examine your heart and repent. But what if I've gone too far? I mean, haven't you had someone tell you? Oh, you're going through this because God's punishing you. You know what? That's none of their business. That's not even my business as your pastor to tell you when you've gone too far and that's it. Yep, you're smitten now. That's not my business. That is between you and God. If you're alive today, while it's still called today, you can repent. And that is the message I have for you. Stop what you're doing, run to God, and fall on His mercy. And that's the message here. This is, no, this is very important, no matter how many times you have to do it. Don't fall for the devil's are you sure you're serious? You've repented of this particular sin so many times. You really think God believes you? That's the devil talking. You remember what Peter asked Jesus? How many times should I forgive my brother? And Jesus tells him 70 times 7, 490 times. The point is, if you counted 490 times and said, Ah, that's 491. I don't have to forgive you anymore. If you're counting that many times, you're not forgiving. You're not casting it away as far as the east is from the west. God doesn't keep count. Remember Psalm 103. He's cast our sins as far away as the east is from the west. And that's pretty far. Fall on God. Especially if you're convicted. Well, maybe I'm not sinning enough. I'm just convicted because maybe I'm... Stop it! You know who the hardest person it is to walk down the aisle is? Me. I'm the pastor. I can't do that. They'll know I'm a sinner. Duh. <laughs> and then he tells us, while you can, today while it's called today, encourage each other. You know, I've always felt that the most important message you can hear from a man of God is not do better, try harder, Baptize more people. Read more Bible studies. I've always thought that the most important message you could hear from a man of God is don't give up. Keep going. Keep after. I know it's hard. To encourage each other is the most important thing we can do for each other. Anybody can say, you can do better than that. And you know what? There are places for that. But I don't think that's necessarily the spiritual message that you need to hear. From a coach, that's what I want to hear. Good. You did that in this much time. I think you can do better. Push a little harder. I think that's a good lesson to hear in life. But when you come to stand before God for which you can never do enough, for whom God sits there on His throne and says, I'm perfect and you're scum? I think perhaps encouragement is the word we need. Because you can never live up to God. You can never do enough for God. And the devil is constantly poking and prodding you with that. You'll never be good enough. Stop right there, devil. You are a child of God. You don't need to please God. Okay, you hear me? But that doesn't mean, oh, party come, I can do whatever I want. I'm not saying that. I'm saying God doesn't have a list. Let's start with the Ten Commandments. Oh, no, he took that one. Oh, and this one too. And that one again? He's not doing that. He, he's not sitting there on his throne waiting for me to get a ten so I can get a, a good mark on my paper. I'm already his child. His son has already died for me to give me salvation and acceptance. The hardest thing when you're teaching your kid to ride a bike, when they fall off, 
is to get them back on that bike again. And that is the most important lesson that they learn. So when you're riding your spiritual bike and you fall off and you're skin your knees again, the most important thing you can do is to be encouraged to get back on that bike and go for something. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying here. The church needs more people like Barnabas. Barnabas, the name means son of encouragement. We need more people to encourage and lift up others than we need people to stand on the sidelines and point out all the things we're doing wrong. And so hold on. Get back on the bike and go. You're probably going to fall off again. A couple years ago, uh, when we, it's been a number of years since we had that really, really rainy year, I was riding my bike on Lake Elizabeth Road in August. And I drove across a little strict trickle of water going down Lake Elizabeth Road, and it was still so wet, there was moss on the road in August. And I dropped my bike on a Saturday morning on Lake Elizabeth Road thinking, there's going to be a truck and I'm going to die. <laughs> and I encouraged myself to get back up really quick. Skin, knees, and all. Idleness, complacency lead to surrender. Why should I bother? It, it's too hard. The goal is too high. I can't reach it. But simple service in your daily life where you're not looking at a chart to see how well you did, but just doing it, that develops strength for the long haul. Verse 15. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Now, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear they would never enter his rest? If not those who disobeyed. So we see they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Now who was God mad with? His people. Not the Egyptians, not the Babylonians, not the Assyrians, not the Hittites. His people. They're supposed to be His. I'm God's child and I don't care. <coughs> now, he, gets, he just got done saying this a few verses ago, verse 7, and now he's back at it, saying it again. Actually, in Hebrew thought, that means this is really important. Listen up. I'm repeating it again because I want you to get it. So, repetition means sirens and fire bills and red flashing lights. Pay attention. Why was God angry? They were rebelling and they were his own people. He saved them and took care of their needs. He revealed his will clearly. And they still rebel. What's wrong with this picture? And it's not written here so you can go, oh yes, those evil people. It's written here so I can go, what about me? Am I doing that to God? Am I running around saying, Jeremiah has a particularly sarcastic approach to the people of his day. And you probably don't get it when you read it in English. But what he says is, don't comfort yourself by saying, this is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. And you get the impression that it's a song they used to sing to tell themselves how wonderful it was. And God comes back and says, I'm going to tear it all down. My own house. I'm going to destroy it completely. And that should tell you that God thinks more of his people than he does of the building. But see, that was a lesson they needed to learn. And it's not a matter of you did this sin or you did this sin or look, 
these three sins over here, God really hates those the most. And I did all three of them? Oh no. It's not a matter of counting the number of sins. Sins are the symptom. They're not the disease. You don't, you don't have sins. You are a sinner. And because of the nature of my heart, that encourages me to sin. Sin is what happens because I'm rebelling against God. And I believe, just like the author, let me look back there again. Uh, verse 19. So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. God says they would not enter his rest because they disobeyed. But verse 19 says they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Those are connected. Disobedience comes out of unbelief. If you're believing God, you're going to seek to serve him and to live for him. But if you get to the point where you stop trusting God, you stop having faith in God, you stop believing God, you're going to find that disobedience follows because from that. And in my never-to-be-humble opinion, unbelief, just like you'll shoot your eye out in the Christmas story, unbelief is the theme throughout Scripture. Not disobedience, but unbelief. Because unbelief always precedes <coughs> disobedience. Why did Adam and Eve eat the apple? Because they stopped trusting God. They trusted the word of the serpent. And because of that, then they disobeyed. In fact, I believe that calling someone or being called a believer is a higher compliment than to call someone a Christian. Because I mean, think about it. Read the newspaper. Look in the news. Look around the world. Christian means a lot of things these days. Believer means something special. As a matter of fact, when Karen and I lived in the Midwest, low of these many years ago, it, it was very popular and very social to be a Christian. And me, being the rebellious Southern California boy that I am, I used to say, you know, at least in California, when you say out loud in public, I'm a Christian, it kind of means something. When you're in a place where it's unpopular to be a Christian and you say I'm a Christian, that takes a little bit of nerve to do that. When you're in a place where it's popular to be a Christian and unpopular not to be a Christian, the opposite. Jesus Christ is superior to the angels, to the law, even to Moses, because of who he is. He's God. He's faithful in fulfilling God's will for you. Therefore, don't rebel. Don't turn away. Listen to what he has to say. <clears throat> Seek to live for him. Cling to him and reject unbelief. Let's pray.